It's a very short, easy chapter as we near the end of our chemistry school year, and it's called kinetics, or what we call reaction rates. And when you want to express the rate of a reaction, you can measure something called the average rate, which is a change in a given quantity per some unit of time. Now frequently what we'll use is some kind of molarity, that's a, often a very common one, and that would be the number of moles per liter, and often it might be, say, per second, but it could be per minute or any unit of measurement that you wish. So our reaction rate is going to be stated as the change in concentration of either a reactant or product expressed per some unit of time, such as molarity, which is moles over liters, per second. When we want to express the concentration of a reactant or the concentration of a product, we often put brackets around it. So if you see something that looks like this with brackets, that means the molarity of nitrogen dioxide or the molar concentration of it. And that's not a true statement down there at the bottom. Reaction rates must always be positive. It is entirely possible for you to measure not only the reaction rate based upon the appearance of a product, but it could also be based upon the disappearance of a reactant. So not entirely correct, but for our purposes, we'll stay positive. Now for a reaction to occur, a number of things have to happen. We call this theory or model the collision model because the first tenet of this model is that a particle, like an atom or a molecule, has to collide with another particle in order for a reaction to even begin to start. Not only do they have to smack into each other, they have to smack into each other at just the right angle. If they don't collide at the right angle, then that's not what we call a successful collision or an effective collision. So they have to collide. They have to collide at just the right angle. And the third important part of it is that they have to smack into each other with enough energy. Now we call that energy the activation energy and they have to hit hard enough to temporarily stick together in this very large, unstable, temporarily bonded together thing called the activated complex. It's an intermediate. It doesn't hang around very long because it's so unstable. So the formation of hydrogen iodide, for example, doesn't instantly go from hydrogen and iodine making hydrogen iodide. It has to form this activated complex first that's a temporary high energy molecule that quickly breaks apart, but with the atoms involved arranged in a different configuration. There's a little picture of that. There's my hydrogen. There's my much larger iodine. When they make at the right orientation, they're going to form this thing called the activated complex where they're all stuck together. But then as they break apart and release energy, now what we have is the formation of the hydrogen iodide. So the process ends up with two molecules of a hydrogen and an iodide together when you had started with two molecules, one of hydrogen and one of iodine. So got to collide, collide with the right orientation, stick together temporarily in this activated complex, its bonds will break, but this time with a different orientation in the bonds of the products. Now, the more collisions that you can have, the higher the reaction rate. So there's a number of factors that influence reaction rate, which we will examine in a lab about reaction rate. And one of the most common um, factors that influence rate is concentration. So if there's more particles packed in per unit of volume, then there's going to be a possibility of having a greater number of collisions, which will speed up the reaction rate. So increasing concentration results in an increase in reaction rate for every reaction that I can think of. Increasing the frequency of effective collisions will increase the reaction rate. Remember that word effective means not only did they collide, they collided at the correct angle and with sufficient activation energy. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Good part here to find out that in this black spot, there was media that could not be found. So I'll try to find that media that I will be able to play in the classroom for you.
Now this should be a familiar diagram to you. This is an energy diagram showing on the horizontal axis this is time going by, sometimes called the reaction coordinate. And this is a measure of the energy that's trapped in the bonds, say, of the reactants. So all the reactants start with a certain amount of energy trapped in their own bonds, but when a carbon monoxide bumps into a nitrogen dioxide, they will smack, hopefully, with enough energy. Here is the enough energy. Start from the actual line where the reactants begin in their energy content, and travel to the height of this, what we call, energy hill. That's that activation energy necessary for an effective collision. At that point, that's where this guy forms, that clunky looking activated complex, unstable, high energy, breaks apart, and forms now carbon dioxide and nitrogen monoxide. Notice that they are at a lower energy content. The only thing that could have happened here was there was a net release of energy, and of course that's right, you would have been looking at an exothermic reaction. Let me make sure we see that picture. In an exothermic reaction, the hallmark is the products are at a lower energy content and are much more stable than the higher energy content original reactants. Of course, if we change the direction of that reaction, then an exothermic would become endothermic. Notice how the universe discriminates against an endothermic reaction because you're looking for more activation energy here and we have to suck energy in from the environment, from the surroundings, to pack it into the bonds of these products. So products in an endothermic reaction end up with more energy trapped in their bonds than the reactants began with. Anything with more energy is considered to be more unstable. And the universe typically doesn't like to move in that direction. But as you know, whether or not you're endo or exothermic is not the only factor that drives a reaction to proceed. There must be something happening possibly that increases the disorder, which would then account for why that reaction proceeded. There are a couple of factors that influence reaction rate, and then I will stop there. One of those is, what is the substance that's actually reacting? Let's compare these two equations here. I hope you can see the very simple aluminum and oxygen makes aluminum oxide necessitates only having to break a few bonds and reforming a few bonds. Whereas burning this octane and oxygen to make CO2 and water has lots of bonds to break. So the number of bonds to be broken or those to be reformed or the types of bonds that could be quite strong might impact your reaction rate. When you see a precipitation reaction where a solid forms where none had existed before, that can happen quite quickly. But in the chemical weathering of rock, that's a very, very slow reaction rate. It proceeds, but slowly. So the sh fewer number of bonds to be broken occur at a faster rate than when you have lots of bonds in the chemical equation to break and to reform. We already learned that as the number of particles go up, the number of effective collisions will increase. And we call that concentration. Uh, there's a rule against smoking in hospitals because oxygen in its purest form, 100%, would cause an explosion so if grandma with emphysema is dragging her oxygen tank around and smoking a cigarette at the same time, that's a bad mix. Pure oxygen would result in an explosion, but only 20% in the atmosphere causes a much slower oxidation rate, a burn. So there's no smoking in hospitals. And that's a demonstration of the impact of concentration. A third factor that impacts the reaction rate is surface area. As you know, reactions take place on the surface of a substance. So if I can increase the surface area, then I can increase the rate of a reaction. A common example might be when I start a fire, I don't hold a match to a solid 12 inch thick log. I put some kindling down there. If I'm cheating, I put some newspaper bundled up underneath that. They're all basically cellulose products, but when I light the newspaper on fire, greater surface area, 
rapid oxidation, which is enough to get the larger pieces of wood started. Increasing surface area will cause an increase in the reaction rate. And for most reactions, increasing the temperature increases the kinetic energy of the particles. And when you increase the kinetic energy of the particles, you're going to hopefully increase the number of effective collisions, which would increase the rate. Once again, particles can bump into each other, but if they're only moving along kind of slowly, because temperatures are low, they might not collide with sufficient activation energy for an effective collision to actually take place. So increasing the temperature increases kinetic energy, the number of effective collisions increase, the reaction rate proceeds at a higher rate. Typically, if you increase the temperature of a reaction vessel up to 10 degrees, you'll basically double the rate of the reaction. And this is something that kind of shows as temperature increases, this line is measuring what we call reaction rate, and it's not a straight line. You can see that it's really starting to increase the reaction rate with an increase in temperature. Finally, a catalyst, or sometimes an inhibitor, a catalyst speeds up a reaction and an inhibitor slows it down. A catalyst is defined as a substance which will alter the rate of a chemical reaction without itself being consumed or permanently changed. And as we learned in the last chapter, essentially what a catalyst does is it provides a new, easier pathway for the reaction mechanism. The red line characterizes without a catalyst. The blue line shows the, how the activation energy is lowered when a catalyst is added. And sometimes catalysts can be, say, the surface of metals, where atoms or molecules sort of are quickly bumped into each other and are able to react more readily because it provides a surface for the interaction of the atoms or molecules to um, take place. Uh, enzymes are catalysts that speed up reactions inside living organisms, inside your cellular mechanisms. And those often work with a certain shape of a catalyst that fits into parts of the two or more things that need to come together. But what will happen regardless is that this guy, the activation energy, is lowered. Therefore, you have the reaction happen more rapidly but notice that the change in enthalpy stays the same because you start and end with the same heat content trapped in the bonds of the reactants and products. Finally, we're going to stop here for the discussion on reaction mechanisms, and that will conclude this very short set of two vodcasts that cover our chapter on kinetics. Until the next time.